Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. And reality, and in the second hour, to Ross Hamilton about the mystery of the Great Serpent Mound. But Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and can be heard every Thursday evening from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here live on the Inception Radio Network. Um, if you've missed a show, please do go by to the Just Energy Radio webpage, <clears throat> excuse me, www.justenergyradio.com, where you can download all of our back episodes. Or you can check them out on YouTube on the Just Energy Radio channel. Uh, and while you're on the webpage, sign up for our newsletter. If you go to the YouTube channel, please subscribe to our channel and support the show. Um, just one other quick announcement. Um, you know, the fall season is coming up. If you are in the Oklahoma area, I will be speaking at the Paranormal Times Paracon on September 21st in El Reno, Oklahoma. Um, also, a good friend of mine, Bruce Cunningham, is hosting the Ancient Mysteries Conference on uh, September 21st in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So if you're up in that area, I would go check that out. That's Ancient Mysteries Conference. Um, and then, as always, you know, coming up in November is the uh, Haunted haunted uh, Mysteries Conference. But see, and that's so- kind of interesting. I'm just going to throw in something. There's a myth that comes out of South America that said that their crops, you know, and I don't remember what they said, um, you know, if it was a specific crop, but that they grew in a week, you know, and the Spanish conquistadors made these comments that how could the land over here be Yunca? I love that. How could it be Yunca on this side of the valley, but over on this side of the valley, it grows just like everywhere else in the world. And it just makes me wonder if they had the same tradition of their crops growing in a week. Oh, that, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard anything about that, but that's possibly true. But um, language really is one of the the key links between all these ancient um, traditions, as far as I'm concerned. A lot of what I learn, I get out of um, through through the process of comparing languages between the Egyptians and the Dogon African tribe and Buddhist, ancient Buddhism and an ancient Tibetan tribe called the Naki. And even sometimes uh, as far away as the Maori in New Zealand, all these ancient words, the farther back in time you go, the more commonality you find between the way terms are used. And so if you have an idea about what a symbol might represent, if you can just get to the ancient words for what are, you know how it was um, how it was presented, how it was written, how and how it was spoken, comparing those things, you can find out a lot about what the symbol represented. And so, you know, let's use your wheat example, because I think that's pretty simplistic. So it's kind of like, you know, it made me think of um, a Star Trek Next Generation episode where they were talking about, you know, the circle in a circle, you know, so kind of like a a hydrogen atom, you know, where there's a, a thing with a circle around it. Anyway, I mean, do you find that same symbol represented in other cultures and does it mean wheat or have something to do with agriculture or is it more associated like with the sun um there there really is a lot of commonality especially among cultures that 
that share a lot of the same traditions. For example, in China, I just finished writing a book about China that's at the publishers, and I discovered that the ancient Chinese hieroglyphic word for week is written with two glyphs, the Chinese sun glyph and the Chinese number 10, and they had a 10-day week. So um, at a certain level back there, it looks like it was all very, very much the same. Do you um, have any thought to how far back these traditions maybe needed to go in order to find that commonality? Okay, well, writing doesn't really appear until around 3000 B.C., and before that, we don't really have written records to go by, although we have petroglyphs and we have, you know, um, you know, art, artistic things that people created. We have symbols um, on clay pots or we have um, characters that were carved into bones in, in China and things like that. So it's hard to tell much beyond uh, 3400 B.C. But um, what we can do is we can study um, how the word meanings carried forward in certain cultures. For example, the modern Turkish language, there are certain words you can find that where multiple meanings that are assigned to the same sound um, are reflected in pretty much the same format in the ancient Egyptian dictionaries. So a lot of these words tend to hold their meaning for a very long period of time. So if you can even find um, a representative modern dictionary, sometimes you can find commonalities. I mean, when I, when I think of that idea, um, you know, when we're talking about, like, deities, you know, there's the prefix, I guess, I'll, I'll call it, yep. of L, you know, where that shows up as, you know, a, a prefix to a name or part of a name, which always seems to be tied to some kind of a, a deity. I mean, wouldn't that be a correct statement? Um, yes, and, and what I do find is that before writing existed and in the cultures that never developed writing, like the Dogen, uh, that certain prefixes and suffixes do carry um, symbolism, just the sound of the word carries symbolism. And so, like, the Dogen word for their creator god, Amma, is really a compound of two sounds, Am and Ma. And Am represents the concept of knowledge, which in a biblical sense refers to the idea of um, con uh, biological conception. And Ma refers to perceiving things, which is the cosmological act that causes waves to turn into particles when you're creating matter. And so the name of the god reflects creation, the, the starting point of creation from two different standpoints. And those kinds of prefixes and suffixes carry around quite um, consistently. You can go to Tibet and find them, or you can go to um, China and find them. But then you also have certain cultures like ancient India, where it seems that all, pretty much all of the words are different. Although even when you go back far enough and you still have certain phonetic values that hold true, but you find concepts expressed in very, very different words, very different language than some of the other cultures. Okay, so Amma, Amma, yeah, that's what you said. Have to think about it a second because I didn't write it down. Um, was that one of the nomo, per chance? Well, even the word nomo is an Egyptian word, numa. It's really a compound word. And nu is a, a concept that the Dogen have and the Egyptians have. It, it's the concept of water or waves, and it represents um, creation at, at its beginning. And uh, ma means um, perceived. So waves perceived is the starting point of, of creation. But see, I just find that really interesting that, um, you know, knowledge and creation, you know, those two independent words um, are still tied to this water, you know, idea, water deity, water idea, which is definitely part of the whole beginning of the creation myth. Um, you know, I, I just find it fascinating because wherever you look around the world, you know, the stories that they tell always seem to um, have kind of the same narrative. Um, they definitely are in the same order, you know, but it's kind of like the names have changed and the details are a little bit different. And it sounds like even in their language, you find, you know, similar things popping up. 
Well, I was uh, citing an example for somebody today about how when you compare traditions, you can reconcile what look like differences between traditions. For example, in the, the Dogen tradition, matter is woven by a spider, and it's woven in the form of a web, and the spider's name means mother. When you go to Egypt, matter is woven by a mother goddess, but it's woven on a loom with, using a shuttle. And so... How do you, outwardly it looks like those are very two different traditions. How would you reconcile those two? Until you come to the Buddhist tradition where matter is woven by a spider whose name means mother in the form of a web, but as if on a loom with a shuttle. See, I so love that. When you compare these cultures and start comparing more and more cultures together, you start to see how these little component pieces really fit together into a bigger picture that, that could have been the starting point for all of them. Well, you find the sp mother spider also as part of the creation story in some uh, North American mythology. Yeah, I yes, just yes. love when you start, you know, you, you find these little independent things, but then you start digging and it's like, well, wait a minute, they, they're they talking about the same stuff. I just find that so exciting, don't you? <laughs> oh, I, I find it really exciting. As a matter of fact, the, the Chinese tradition carries over in a couple of different interesting ways into North America. For example, the... Um, the concept of a yurt, which comes out of Mongolia and Siberia, which is a round, sort of portable um, tent structure that gets that that moves around, that has a lot of the same symbolism as a Buddhist stupa. So I like to think of it as a portable stupa. A stupa is an aligned ritual shrine that has symbolism to it, and it's sort of the starting point of a lot of these traditions. Well, that round yurt has all the same symbolism as a roundhouse for the Navajo Indians, even down to the names that it gets called and the different forms that it takes and the symbolism that they attach to the structure. So there are a couple of different uh, threads here that, that seem to carry it from Asia um, over into North America. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a gentleman, Michael uh, Witzer, which I'm part of the way through his book, We'll have to talk. It's been a very interesting read. Um, you know, it's it's like, you know, 400 pages long and pretty dense, so I'm sure you'll love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, one of his theories, and I'm, I haven't quite gotten to the meat of the theory, is that um, all mythology started, you know, the, the core of it started about 100,000 years ago, which is why it explains you find some of these traditions in Australia and in uh, North and South America, you know, because, I mean, if you think about it, if North America being very conservative was settled 12,000 years ago, you know, it the, the myths had to exist prior to them coming to the Americas. Right. That's right. And uh, a lot of what they're finding in Australia is very hard to explain if you don't postulate that it happened really early. So... Um, and they're finding all, there's a, a great book Michael Cremo wrote called Forbidden Archaeology. It's about a 700-page book, and it documents all of the the unexplainable finds, you know, the things that don't fit into the paradigm that were, have been found in archaeological digs, <laughs> and some of them are, are very interesting. Well, I mean, the stuff that he talks about in that book, you don't even find anywhere. You know, you don't read about it. It's just hidden in some archive somewhere, Warehouse 13. I mean, that's all I can really think because, um, you know, even the reports of a lot of these finds are so old and you don't hear about stuff like that now. Or you might happen to run across something like that and it might be in the news for like five minutes and then it's gone. Just gone. Yes. I know. Well, that's part of the reason why a lot of the, the sources that provide the best material for me are the ones that were written before, you know, 1900, because the researchers who were doing their work back then were not, um, did, they didn't constrain themselves with the same um, academic filters and boundaries that modern academics seem to be constricted by. I just love how some of them write. I read a book recently about the something and the Piccaninnies, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know that that would get by some editing of the anymore. That, that has taken place since. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that um, 
I was noticing in some of your material is that you um, have investigated, and I'm hoping I'm going to say this correctly, the Dongba script, D-O-N-G-B-A, Dongba yes. script of yep. the Noxie in China. Yes. Yep. And c- could you talk about them a little bit? You know, who were the Noxie and what makes their script unique? Okay, the Noxie were a little priestly tribe that lived in a very remote region in the high country between Tibet and China, and the very very ancient tribe. They have a very ancient hieroglyphic language, but it's the last surviving hieroglyphic language in the world, so there still are some um, living priests who are able to read the hundreds of thousands of texts that they wrote in this, this script. And the script is considered to be a predecessor of the ancient Chinese hieroglyphs, so it's very old, and it's understood by traditional researchers that the script was developed to to write primarily about ideas that relate to cosmology and creation. They were trying to put down into writing things that relate to um, how things were created. And a lot of the scripts have things in common with ancient Egypt, and they have symbols in common with uh, the Dogen cosmology and the Buddhist cosmologies I study. And uh, it's a very interesting language. Uh, another interesting uh, feature of the tribe is that their name, Naxi, um, it's, it's a complicated name. Sometimes it's pronounced N-A-X-I, or sometimes it's N-A-K-H-I. And it's like there's this complex suffix on the end of it that nobody's quite sure what to do with. Well, I know from the research that I've done that back in ancient there were certain cultures that tended to send deliberately send out priestly tribes, and these tribes had certain naming conventions based on what aspect of creation they they emphasized. And the Nak Nakxi name, the Nakhi name, fits the format of that naming convention. The first piece of the name always tells you what aspect of creation they they sort of majored in, and the last piece is an Egyptian word Sakai that means to celebrate. And so you have the Amaziki tribes, which are the pre-dynastic tribes in Egypt, and that word Ziggy is a match for a Dogen word Ziggy, and I see that also as um, having started out as that Egyptian word Sakai that means to celebrate. And so you go all all around. Even in ancient China, one of the, um, the earliest creator gods in China, they're not sure whether he was a god or if it was a series of emperors or if it was a tribe, but the name is Fuxi, F-U-X-I. And I took a look at the name and I said, I can tell you right away that's, a, that's the name of a tribe because there's a naming convention. And the naming convention is so so pervasive. You go to Egypt, um, it doesn't always follow the format with the X-I, but it does follow the format with naming the, the deity or the stage of creation and a word next to it that says, here's what we celebrate. So in e- Egypt, they were called Mira, which means... Um, uh, um, loves Ra. In Judaism, it was Yahuda, which means praises Yah. Um, in New Zealand, it was Ma Maori, which means uh, praises or celebrates Ma. And you can find this all around the world in certain tribes that use the same convention. And so, uh, language can really really help you sort things out pretty easily. Also, the Naki are understood to have originally been black Africans, which means it looks to me as if uh, they did start out as a, as a tribe that was sent out of Africa, either from Egypt or from, from one of the other groups that were in Africa, uh, similar to the Dogen. The Dogen themselves seem to be one of these priestly groups that was sent out and deliberately um, went somewhere to locate themselves that was inaccessible to the rest of the world. It's sort of like making a backup copy of the tradition that would survive. So the Naki are very interesting to me because um, they have so many of these different aspects of, of what I've been studying. So when you, I mean, there's what they say, and then there's what you've observed, which I think could be two totally different things. So when you look at the script of the Naxi and compare it to comparable uh, symbols in Chinese script, I mean, do you find parallels or is it just their imagination that they're seeing parallels? I no, mean, it's, it's, uh, there are definite relationships. And one of the nice things about these ancient creation traditions is that for any symbol or any word, 
you typically have um, additional information that comes to play. I consider each word to be sort of a bundle um, because the word is typically associated with at least two, two distinct meanings that are separated from one another logically so that knowing the first one doesn't let you reasonably guess the second one. And then it's also usually associated with a drawn symbol, either a glyph or a, a picture, like a cosmological drawing. And then a lot of times it's associated with a deity or a stage of a myth, some um, myth, mythological story. And so when you take all of this evidence combined together, you have a package that you can go now go compare to another culture. And if they hit you know, all the elements of that package, you know you've got a lock on a match. And there's no question, there shouldn't be any question that it's a match. Um, and I use this all the time in trying to equate words and ideas back and forth between Buddhism and, and the Dogen and Egypt. And I had an Egyptologist the other day ask me, well, you know, couldn't this be coincidence or couldn't this be just a matter of someone wishfully interpreting something? And I'd say, no, it can't be. There are too many, too many points in common. No, I... I would have to agree with you just based on my own research, you know, looking at them from a cultural perspective, from a mythological perspective, from a ritual perspective, you know, they do too many of the same things to not have language be part of that too, because it's through language that we transmit ritual and that we transmit culture, written or not. Right. Now, what's, what's particularly interesting is that I've come across some terms recently that look to be quite archaic. Um, they're even described by the woman who wrote the Dogen Dictionary as being very archaic terms. And when I say that, it may go back thousands of years before um, when writing first emerged. And these terms follow some different conventions than the terms I'm used to. They, they don't always use the same phonetic values to represent the same things. And the words that survived and got written down in Egypt and places like that don't follow the same spelling conventions that the Egyptian words use. And so it's very interesting to, to look at these things and try to sort it out. Well, you know, I took a look at the, um, the Dongbu, Dongba, that script stuff. Anyway, but when I looked at it, the first thing it made me think of was like Aztec or Mayan script. And I right. was wondering if you looked at any of the, um, you know, manuscripts that have survived or have come out of Mesoamerica and done any comparison between that script in particular and um, stuff that we find in the New World. Uh, no, I haven't. And the, the reason I haven't, uh, first of all, the, the scripts that I've seen that have come out of the New World are are – seem to be substantially different from the ones I'm working on, at least in, in the versions that, that we have. I mean, it, that's hard to say um, completely because like the, the cuneiform script that you find started out as hieroglyphic characters and, and what we're used to seeing as the ancient language is really an intermediate step. It wasn't what the original language looked like. And that's true in a lot of these cases that you see what is presented as here is the official script of the culture, but when you dig into it, you realize that that it goes back farther than that and it has evolved over time. So my problem is that as I sort of make my way around the world from, from Africa to Egypt to India to Tibet to China to North America, I haven't gotten as far as Central and South America yet. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I haven't really All right, had, so I'll give you a couple of weeks, those. you know. Uh, um. No, I just found it interesting. I mean, I've looked at, you know, some of the different uh, manuscripts that we have. I mean, obviously, there aren't very many. And it just had a very similar feel to it. I mean, not based on any characters, but just, you know, there's a guy over here. There's this thing, you know, that you really can't quite make out what it is that's over there. You know, and I mean, one of the things that I've really been looking into personally lately is information that we've lost because we don't understand the symbology anymore you know that library of symbology is just lost and um you know so it'd be interesting to see if you know in these other cultures if it would bring light into the some of the symbology because you know there's the actual mayan script but then they have the you know their books they just have all these pictures 
you know, that aren't right. really writing, but they obviously have to have some very deep uh, symbolic meaning. I, you know, at least that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you, and uh, I, I believe that there's a lot there to be found, even with as many uh, manuscripts that have been destroyed as there have been. I know there are uh, preserved libraries, underground libraries in Timbuktu and in India and places like that, and I'm sure there are, is a wealth of knowledge that hasn't really been uncovered yet that might help explain some of this. But in, especially in South America, you know, there was a, a huge amount of information that was lost. That's just so sad. Uh, the the Naki script does remind me a lot of what what I see in Central and South America. And one of the problems with the Naki script is just there's so many glyph symbols that um, that your average person would have a very hard time mastering the writing of it. Uh, in Egypt, you have four thousand characters, but the Naki maybe have ten thousand. And so the just the sheer task of trying to to learn and remember and understand what each what each symbol represents. Also, in the Egyptian language, um, my way of looking at the Egyptian language, the language itself defines the meaning of its own glyphs. So if you forget what a certain glyph means, you can find the word where that glyph it lives at the end of the word and isn't pronounced, and that's a definition of what the glyph means, symbolically. And so that's part of how I've evolved a lot of the the interpretations of what these glyphs are, I start with that and see what the Egyptian word tells me, and then I try to verify it back to other cultures. Interesting. Um, there was a question in the chat room, so I'm just going to go ahead, and this was from American Road Warrior. Road Warrior. Um, okay. And so the question is, does he have an opinion on the mystery? Oh, that wasn't the first one. Oh, we have quite a few questions. All right, um, but I'll ask this one. It's about the pyramids. And so the first one, any information regarding theories regarding the pyramids, and I'll just throw the second one out too. Uh, Any opinion on the mysterious helicopter hieroglyphs in the Temple of Abydos? Okay, well, we'll start with the first question about the pyramids. Um, And this is a little little complicated to explain. Um, Coming out of the Dogen tradition, I realized that there was a relationship between the concept of a cubit and the concept of a light year. And in Dogen mythology, there's a character who plays the role of light, who measures out the universe essentially in cubits. And it measures 8 billion cubits, 8 billion steps. And um, in trying to trace that through, I discovered that the Egyptian word for cubit is uh, a compound that means light measure. And I then went to the pyramids because I knew that the way that we know how how large an Egyptian cubit was is from the Great Pyramid, the dimensions of the pyramid. And so um, I understood that the Great Pyramid measures 440 cubits per side on the square base and 280 cubits high. And I also know that my friend Robert Boval thinks that these three pyramids, the, the large ones at Giza, represent the belt stars of Orion. And so I went to Google on my computer, and I keyed in the numbers 440 and 280 and Orion, and I turned up references to an invisible structure out in space called Barnard's Loop that measures 440 light years by 280 light years. It's a birthplace of stars, and it's a spiral. When they image it with time-lapse photography, because it's giving off a very faint amount of light, you can see that it looks like it's a spiral that circles around the belt stars of Orion. And the Dogen tribe refer to that structure, even though nobody can see it, as the chariot of Orion, and it's very important in their creation tradition. And when you image it, it looks like the wheel of a chariot that Orion the hunter is standing in. Now, for the Dogen um, the belt stars of Orion are um, considered to be deputies of Sirius. They're, they're there symbolically. Their, their symbolic meaning is, is important in terms of trying to point us back to Sirius. So somehow there's a whole huge aspect of this creation tradition that's wrapped up in trying to point us to this structure, Barnard's Loop, to the belt stars of Orion, and to Sirius. And so... My perspective on the on the pyramids is that just as the Dogen tribe 
stack stones up on a plateau to represent stars in their creation tradition, that the pyramids also were meant to represent stars, and that the alignments that they have to stars are important symbolically in that tradition. Well, American Road Warrior, Road, if I could just talk, Road Warrior said, nice, it sounds like he furthered the Orion connection. So two thumbs up to you, Laird. Well, um, thanks. Um, oh, the, what about the helicopter thing? Was thing? That, uh, we've had, I've heard, had people say that those belt stars represent, I mean, those uh, pyramids represent the belt stars, but I was frustrated that nobody gave us a reason other than it pointed to a particular era of time. Um, Robert Boval's perspective is that it's a sta- help it, like the, the orientation of the Sphinx, it's there to establish a, a time frame uh, at uh, 10,500 B.C., and I think it does that also. So do you think it's 10,500 B.C., or do you think they could be older? Well, I think they could be older. Well, actually, the reason why they probably couldn't be older is because um, both the Sphinx and the pyramids point to the same era. And the most likely way that they would have pointed to that era is if they were built during that era. And there's not much reason for somebody who had been there earlier than that to point to that era. Then you also have problems because the events that happened at the end of the Ice Age look to me as if they involved a change in the tilt of the planet. And if they did, then anything that had been aligned before that event wouldn't still be aligned. Well, that's right, because we got those extra five days. Right. Does that come into that, that too? Any, anything that would change the tilt of the planet would throw all the, all the alignment stuff off. But then you have things, structures like in the in Mexico, you have complexes where every building is six degrees off of of north or in china where every structure is you know some small number the same small number of degrees off of north south east and west and so all of that evidence just helps confirm for me that there have been changes in the tilt so does that tie in with the velikovsky's velikovsky's material or is that just part of the natural changes that happen with the planet? Well, it could be either way because there are other bo- astronomic bodies, you know, other planets in our system that we know have changed their tilt from time to time. We don't know how or why, but we know that they have. And so it might just be a natural thing that happens or it might be something that happens because of a catastrophe, and it's hard to say which. Um, a lot of the, the questions that I research start out in that kind of kind of a frame where the evidence is is conflicting, it's contradictory. It might be one thing, it might be the other, and you sort of have to keep an open mind about it until you know more. Well, you know, and it doesn't help that we really don't have a good timeline to work with. You know, I mean, this just kind of came to my mind. Okay, so we have this structure with this alignment going on, and then we have this structure with an alignment going on, but it's six degrees off. And we have this structure with an alignment, but it's four degrees off, except in the other direction, which tells you that, you know, or implies something's going on. But we really don't have good dating to start off with so that we could go, okay, so somewhere between this point and this point, something might have happened. And then you have this window that you can go looking for any kind of physical evidence to support a catastrophe or not a catastrophe or a drought somewhere or something. But even right. without that, it's kind of like we just have these weird circumstantial pieces of evidence. One thing that does um, help is that uh, the creation traditions that I study start out with the building of these aligned shrines. These shrines are like grand symbols for the whole tradition. And it's one of the first things they teach to initiates is how to build and align these shrines according to a very specific method. And the method uh, is directly related to where the sun rises and where shadows get cast and so forth. And so there's, there's really no way that the alignment method can be off, that the alignment method produces an east-west oriented line and a north-south oriented line. And without a really good reason, there would be no reason to vary from, from that. So if you find a culture that seems to share the same cosmological tradition and you can show that they use that same method of alignment, then you've got to suspect that East wasn't where East is now. 
Right. And what I'm saying, but without a good timeline to look at the structures, you know, we can't really place in time when these events happened. No, I mean, we, we can kind of guess. The best we, but... best we can say is that it, uh, anything that's out of alignment um, probably happened before the last time there was a change in that tilt. Right. It happened a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And also <laughs> a lot of times these, times these um, structures, these ritual structures, are built on top of another much older ritual structure. Like even the Egyptian pyramids, they think, are built on, on top of something that was already there. So um, you don't really know for certain, you know, whether they sustained the alignment of the previous structure or whether it was built so far back that it was out of alignment. Good point. Um, so let's kind of go back to some of these symbols that we were talking about. In your opinion, are there deeper meanings and deeper levels of understanding you know, understanding of the universe hidden in these scripts and in these symbols that may have been lost to us today? Um, yes, to a certain extent. In, in the Buddhist tradition, there's uh, something called an, the concept of an adequate symbol. An adequate symbol is defined as a symbol that can't lose its meaning even if the long trail of initiates forget what, forget what it means. And if you think about it, the only way that could be true is if the symbol represents something that you can actually observe and see in nature. And so you have certain Dogen symbols, like the Dogen symbol that represents electrons, protons, and neutrons is the image of an electron orbit. You can, you can take a picture of it with an electron microscope. It's the same shape. Uh, there are a number of other shapes here in the Dogen creation tradition when they talk about how matter is built. They're using symbols for the weaving of matter that represent the three ways that strings intersect each other in string theory. You can set it right side by side with diagrams out of Stephen Hawking or Brian Greene, and they match. Same description, same drawing. So, yes, I think that some of the symbols that we take for granted and we think mean one thing or another might not. A real good example of that is as you're aligning this Buddhist stupa, you go through some geometry that ends up creating intersections between circles. And at the point of intersection, there's a little shape there that gets created, that gets emphasized, that they call the fish, which 3,000 years later turns up as being the fish that represents Jesus. Hmm. So are so, we talking about these intersecting circles kind of like the Merkaba, the flower of life kind of circle thing? <laughs> It's the start of that, basically. It's um, basically very simple geometry that's necessary to be able to first create an east-west oriented line and from that generate a north-south oriented line. So it's not um, rocket science, but it's basic geometry. It's the first thing you would teach somebody if you're trying to teach them geometry. How to but you would have to understand and geometry and in how to draw order circles to teach it in the point. first place. What was that? I said, but you would have to understand basic geometry in order to teach somebody how to do that in the first place. Yes. Well, if you go far enough back in each of these traditions, what you get to is a cultural belief that somebody taught this stuff to them, somebody who knew more than they did. And I was, again, arguing with uh, somebody this week about, um, they were saying, but um, don't you think that there was, that each of these systems is an amalgam that one culture brought, you know, they, they migrated and they brought some of it with them and then that culture moved on to another location and brought some of that with them and it all, it all came together in the end as a combination of different things. And I explained to him that one of the rules I use for myself in trying to uh, interpret things is that I always start from an overt statement on the part of the culture I'm studying. So that if I were going to explore that issue that he raised, I would want to start with a, con a culture that believes that that happened to them. And from what I know, there aren't any. Every culture I've studied, you go back far enough and the belief is somebody smarter than us taught this to us. But they were just an archetype and a figment of our imagination. At least that's what <laughs> yes. they keep telling me. And I'm like, I don't know. You know, if they were smart enough to build the pyramids, they had to have something going on. Uh, that's right. And 
the fact that you can use Egyptian glyphs to lay out a coherent structure of matter from waves to atom argues that somebody knew something. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I've been pondering, and I'm going to throw it at you, and it might be kind of like a curveball, but I'm going to—it's something I've been pondering. Um, but uh, and I, you know, and I want to preface this with I don't have any evidence and I don't have any proof. Um, but the the idea is about ritual and intention and prayer, and and based on your study, do you think it's possible? Uh -huh that our ancestors were able to, you know, manipulate the physical world using ritual intention and prayer. And, you know, and it came down to us as these hollow, you know, say these words and your soul will be saved kind of thing. I mean, do you think that based on you're seeing, you know, ideas that come directly out of science in their cosmology, in their writing, that there might be this possibility that they knew different levels of manipulating matter, thus they were able to walk the stones across the field, or, you know, some of these stories that you hear about, you know, how things were constructed? I, one good indication that that's true is the Sphinx Temple, temple in, at Giza. It's built with 70-ton blocks. And I was listening to an interview recently where somebody asked the question, why would anybody, why would any engineer choose to use 70 ton blocks to build a structure? Because the difficulties involved with that are so enormous that it does not seem like an intelligent choice for anybody who was a thoughtful engineer to make. And my answer to that is, you use 70 ton blocks to build something if you can because it's quicker. If you're able to move 70-ton blocks and move them easily, then it takes a lot less time to build a temple with 70-ton blocks than it does if you're moving bricks and boards. Well, and I mean, so that makes me think that of like the dolmen. You know, it was that very, are all very over easy the place. And, you know, beside the blocks. giant stones that hold the top up, how the heck did they get that top stone up there? And and why? You know, it, right. Right. And... Um, the why of it is, is is always a very interesting question, and there's lots of room for discussion. But just the, the mere fact that they were able to do it, and that they that somebody with engineering background would do it, implies that it was very easy for them to do it. Well, especially when we can't really even do it today without having all kinds of heavy machinery, you know, barely budget into place, and there's right, no evidence right. of any machinery, so. You know, I just can't even imagine, you know, them on their little rollers pushing it along <laughs> to yeah, get it to some other cases, point. The, the way the stones are situated, even if you had the equipment that could lift it, there's not room to get the equipment in to lift it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that creates a difficulty in itself. Clearly, somebody back in those times had was enormously capable. Then left very little evidence. Of you know, right. other than also these monuments that, that they were able to do this. This was child's play for them. They didn't have to leave anything behind. It didn't take a lot of work, a lot of effort, or a lot of equipment. They could just do it. Okay, so this wasn't capitalized, but I, I'm thinking that this is a question. Oh, it said question. So I guess it's a question. Okay, and this is from Rich in CT. Rich in CT. How's that? Okay. And so the question is. Is the Orion Orion Belt depicted in hieroglyphs anywhere? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, that's very interesting. It, it might be in the in words that re represent the concept of a girdle or the concept of a belt, or in words that relate to Orion. But I can't tell you a word off the top of my head where it is. Um, there are depictions. Uh, I just came across a picture the other day in the Buddhist tradition where they're talking about three types of ascent. There are three three kinds that are recognized in Buddhism. One is sort of a vertical raising up of something. Another one is a raising up in a spiral shape. And the third one is given in three steps up um, a staircase. And those three steps, those three images to me represent serious, 
Barnard's Loop, and Orion's Belt. And the three steps would be symbolic of, of the three stars. You know, there are people that make the common, you know, uh, as above, so below. Do you find that that holds true as you look at these cosmological ideas? I can tell you that in the book on China, I just wrote pretty much every symbolic theme and process in ancient China was a different metaphor for as above, so below. And it carries forward also to Egypt and to the these other cultures I study that you, you, you get down to processes like the process of squaring a circle. If you understand where the symbolism comes from, it all leads back to as above, so below. And my description of, of those pyramids, the three pyramids pointing to Orion's belt, according to the Dogen, the reason why it was important to point to that was because that's the structure in the macrocosm that is the macrocosmic counterpart to the tiniest structure in um, in matter, which is the Calabi-Yau sp space in string theory. It's a little bundle of wrapped up dimensions in string theory. And that that's the point where they link what happens below to what happens above. And that pretty much everything else, in Judaism there's a saying that uh, someone asked, um, was asked to explain Judaism in in one sentence and or explain it while standing on one foot and they said do unto others as you would have that have others do unto you and everything else is commentary I think is what the I may have that wrong but that's the basic gist well this is the same way as above so below is the statement of cosmology and pretty much everything else is just commentary on that the Yi Ching is commentary on that and the zodiac is commentary on that from my perspective and all of these different traditions um, that relate to ancient cultures get down to the bottom of it, and it brings you right back to as above, so below. Well, you know, and as we learned at more about the world, the universe, you know, we look out into the sky and we see galaxies, you know, and we see star systems, you know, and so, you know, and they seem very reflective of, you know, what's going on inside of an atom, for example. You know, and so we, at this time, have evidence of that there are relationships, you know, on some levels, you know, as above, so below. And it just always blows me away when you look at these ancient cultures, how much they really understood, like, on a personal level, you know, about that concept as if they had the science, they had the knowledge, they had the technology to know it versus, you know, we like to say about them, you know, ah, they were just making it up and wrote it down kind of thing. Yes, it, it it's true, although um, in Egypt, one of the comments that a lot of researchers make is that everything seems perfect at the very outset and then gets, it declines from that point on. And I compare to a shop class in middle school where uh, the students are expected to build a, a little um, bookshelf. Now, the way the class starts out is that the teacher, who knows perfectly well how to build the bookshelf, builds a perfect one and brings it out and shows it to everybody. And then everybody else builds their own build shelf. All the, all the, the students build their own bookshelf. And none of the students' bookshelves are anywhere close to as perfect as the, the teacher's. And so when I look at Egypt, anything I see that's perfect, I tend to associate with the teachers. And the things that are less perfect, I tend to associate with the students. And so as time goes on in Egypt, suddenly you see them building with much smaller blocks of stone, not 70 tons. And you see the, the great pyramids, some of the, uh, the early pyramids holding up for thousands and thousands of years, and some of the later ones collapsing. Well, I mean, one of the things that I was looking at the other day was um, some of the ziggurats in Iran and Iraq, you know, that were Mesopotamian. And, you know, they were the early, early culture. And you look at the stuff that they built there, and it's just these little mud break, baked brick kind of things, you know, or bricks. Now, I mean, I understand that they had limited uh, materials to work with. But they're really simplistic. I mean, they're supposed to be older than the pyramids, but they're much more simplistic than the pyramids. 
my fact checker, checkers have corrected me on that. What I was trying to say it was Rabbi Hillel, who was asked by a man to to teach him the entire Torah, five books of Moses, while standing on one foot. And <laughs> Hillel did. He said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah, he said. All the rest is commentary. Ah, uh, the fact point. checker. Hi, fact checker. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Road uh, Warrior Reece, had one Reece more question. Reese is always very careful I'm not just out here <laughs> making <laughs> stuff up. Um, do you believe the late popular belief that the Sphinx originally had a larger head of a lion and faced a constellation of Leo? Yes, I think it did. And you can tell it from Egyptian words for Sphinx. One of them is written with um, a lion glyph, and another one is written with a man-headed Sphinx glyph. So clearly... The Egyptian priests or scribes who wrote those words were under the impression that it had originally been a lion. I thought it was a poodle with a tinfoil hat myself. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of theories as to what it was, but when you have a word that depicts it as a lion, you can't argue that the scribes and the priests didn't, wouldn't have been the people who knew best. And if they thought it was a lion, that's good enough for me. That's right. So what's coming up for you, Laird? We have about three or four minutes. What, what's up for you next? Are you working on any new books, giving any presentations? What's up? <laughs> Actually, I've been working on some, some very interesting references that, um, that relate to these very ancient times, to, uh, to Gobekli Tepe, for one thing. And um, I've been working with Ed Nightingale, if you know who he is. He's a, um, a master uh, woodworker from Pennsylvania who has um, some very specific ideas about how the, how the uh, Giza Plateau was laid out. And his scheme of layout happens to fall very well in line with things I learned when I wrote the book on China. So the two of us may get together and try to write something about that. And then I have um, a conference in Virginia Beach um, the second week in October, weekend in October, which uh, with the um, ARE, the Edgar Casey Foundation. And then I'll be at the Paradigm Symposium where you and I saw each other last year. Yeah. Again, the third, third week in, um, in October. Uh, then my book on China will be out hopefully sometime in the next year. It may not be till the fall next year. We'll see. And then I'll be speaking at the, the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge, which is run by Walter Cruttenden. Uh, that will be in um, Rancho Mirage, uh, California, sometime in October 2014. He's already got that booked? Really? <laughs> yes. Reese and I joked last year when there was all the talk about the end of the Mayan calendar. We joked. We just laughed. We said, we know for certain that the end is not coming because the Edgar Casey Foundation has us booked in October the following year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good sign. Um, well, Laird, I mean, we... I don't know. I still have another minute before the music's going to come up. Any last words for the listeners? Um, well, first of all, I've never answered the question about the helicopter glyphs, and um, I can't say definitively whether, what those represented, but I know that there are all sorts of representations in India of things that look like um, modern equipment and references to modern weaponry and flying machines and things like that. So I have to say that it's at least, a, at least an open question whether those could represent something mechanical and that we don't know about. They, they could. I just don't have any evidence to show whether they do or not. Fair enough. Okay. Well, Laird, I know the music's going to come up here in, in a second, so thank you so much for coming on the show, and I know I will talk to you again soon. Yes, please, sometime soon. If you feel like chatting just for fun, you know, in our spare time, give us a call. Well, okay, that sounds great. Okay, thanks, Rita. All right, thanks, Laird. That's Laird Scranton. His webpage is LairdScranton.com. Please do check out all of his books on the Dogon and about China um, and because they're really good. And we will be back with Ross Hamilton after these words from our sponsor. Your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. 